We are very excited to get started today. There's a lot to cover. So I want to quickly thank Jamie Put Putnam for organizing today's event and to introduce our speaker, Dr. Heidi Ginter, Brightview's Medical Director for Massachusetts. Dr. Ginter brings her experience as a physician executive to ensure Brightview's program provides only the best care to our patients in Massachusetts. She's board certified in family medicine and addiction medicine, and she has the clinical and administrative experience to achieve results from the full full spectrum of perspectives, staff, patients, and payers. More importantly, you're going to see that she's very passionate about addiction treatment, and we're excited to hear her thoughts on medication-assisted treatment. With that, I will turn it over to Heidi. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, is everyone able to hear me okay? Jamie, yeah, you can hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. All right. So, I am going to get started, and thank you so much for that introduction. I want to dive right in with the next slide. So, one of the things that I'm going to start with is a moment of gratitude. My colleague, Dr. Laura Kehoe, has shared some of her slides with me, and I have incorporated them into this presentation. She is an amazing human who does this work as well in the MGH system, as well as with Brightview. And so I want to acknowledge her contribution to this presentation. Next slide. So what we're going to do over the next hour is talk about addiction as a chronic disease and talk about the brain changes that go along with that disease and how you can understand someone's behavior by understanding a little more about what's going on in their brain. We're gonna really dive into medication for addiction treatment, understanding the options for opioid use disorder and why it's incredibly beneficial. We'll spend a little time exploring stigma and how that impacts our clients and patients in their road to recovery. And then I want to talk about three specific situations that I've heard of from our local teams and give an opportunity for you to ask questions and address concerns that you have that are inside your brain and your experience. So I want to make this something that is uniquely helpful for each of you who is here today. Next slide. So I'm going to start with a little question here, which is who am I? So next slide. One of the things you know about me is that I'm a doctor because we started out with that introduction, but you also knew a couple things as soon as you logged in. And that is, you saw my face. I'm a white woman. I'm blonde. Um, I'm wearing orange. So I sort of give my, uh, my colors here for the, the Halloween that we are presenting on. And I have tiny little pumpkins, um, that you may not even seen, but some of these things may lead you to have assumptions about me that are really good or very positive, like a lot of people feel like doctor, smart, white woman, sensitive, knows what she's doing, all those credentials, all that experience, like she's really got stuff under control. She gets this. Others of you may have thought of that and thought, mm, doctor, she doesn't actually get it. She doesn't have any experience in recovery. She has absolutely no idea what it's like to work on the street or to have experience as a person who is dealing with people who are sick or who has friends and family and loved ones who have died or who has to address the concerns of the patients and the clients and the people I'm serving, she has no clue. So she may be book smart, but she's street dumb. You may be wondering why me compared to anybody else in Brightview or anyone else in Massachusetts, why, why was I chosen to do this? And what do I have to offer? So a couple things that come off immediately I know is that I present as a person with power and with privilege. I'm a doctor and I'm a white person. Those two things matter. They give me a platform that other people without those privileges and without that recognition by society don't always have. As a person who recognizes her power, I really want to use that to engage with people who don't have that power and advocate for their needs. And that's the place where I'm coming from in doing this presentation. I'm hoping that we can connect as human beings to human beings who are helping other human beings suffering and do the best we can to reduce their suffering and to help them achieve the recovery as they define it. Next slide. So one of the things that I'm also interested in is who are you? So let me tell you the assumptions that I've made about you, even without having to see you. I'm assuming that you're probably curious about this. 
interested to some extent, but maybe a little frustrated and conflicted. You may have experiences that have led you to feel a certain way about people with substance use disorders or feel a certain way about medicines to treat those use disorders. I have a lot of experience with a lot of people who hate methadone, for example, or love Vivitrol, or don't really know what to think about Suboxone. <laughs> My guess is that many of you have lived experience with the disease of addiction, either personally in your own recovery journey or with the people that you're serving, or a combination of both. And I also make the assumption that a lot of us on this call, if not 100%, have lost somebody to this disease. So I speak from a place of recognizing suffering and wanting to, again, engage us in ways that allow us to help reduce suffering for those people who are still struggling with this disease. So let's jump right in. <clears throat> Next slide. I want to talk about addiction and how it meets the criteria as a chronic disease and how we really should be thinking about it as a chronic disease like diabetes, like high blood pressure, like asthma, that if it, these things don't get treated, they can lead to early death. Next slide. So the definition of addiction got reformulated by the American Society of Addiction Medicine a few years back. And a couple components of it that I think are really important for us to recognize is that we talk about it being treatable. We talk about it being a chronic disease, and it's a chronic disease of the brain that is affected by people's genetics, what they inherit that they have no control over. It's infected by the environment in which they're living, breathing, and, and functioning in society. And it's also affected by their life experiences, particularly trauma. We know that people's experiences with trauma really impact how they develop as a human being and what conditions they end up suffering with. People who have really high numbers of adverse childhood experiences have a higher risk of chronic diseases, including addiction and mental health concerns. The thing that's really tricky about addiction is that people continue to do behaviors that don't make sense logically and cause them and their people harm, but they keep doing them anyway. And when they get into treatment, they actually get better. So treatment works. Even when people seem to be doing things that don't make any sense, accessing treatment can really change that trajectory and make those behaviors better. Next slide. So when you compare treatment for addiction to treatment for another chronic disease like high blood pressure, and actually in Dr. McClellan's study here that I've, I'm just showing a part of, he's looking at not only high blood pressure, but also he looks at asthma and diabetes and addiction, the four conditions, and all the graphs look the same that basically before you have treatment of any of these diseases, they're severe, they're out of control. And then you initiate treatment and the severity of the disease and the risks associated with it go down. And then when you stop treatment, the disease returns close to its baseline. It may be a little bit better than it was without treatment, but it generally goes back to a level of severity that's unacceptable. The disease is not in control. And that is something that I want to focus on now for just another minute, because a lot of times patients with opiate use disorder or any addiction will get into treatment with, say, methadone or buprenorphine, and all of a sudden everything changes. They're able to go to work. They're able to engage with their family and friends and their kids, and, and they're functioning in ways that the family hasn't seen in years. And so everyone's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I can't believe this medicine's working so great. You're doing phenomenal. And instead of attaboy, keep going with what you're doing, what the family will often say, or what the treatment providers who don't understand addiction will say is, now get off the medicine. See, you're doing so great, you don't need the medicine anymore. The problem is that they're probably doing so great because of the medicine. So the medicine's really making a difference. Same thing with high blood pressure. When you're on that medicine, your blood pressure goes down. It's not time to stop the medicine. It's time to say, yay, medicine. <laughs> this medicine is helping reduce my risk of stroke and high blood pressure and heart attacks. Next slide. So this is an area that is really important to get back to the idea of we don't have a test like the diabetes test, like the blood sugar test or the hemoglobin A1C to make a diagnosis of addiction. What we have is a set of criteria that somebody needs to meet a certain number of them, and then we label them with the disease, and then we call it mild, moderate, or severe, depending on how many of these criteria they meet. 
But do you see that these criteria are basically behaviors? It's not like it says, and the urine drug screen shows X and the person lost their job because of why it has a lot of different things that like it's kind of behavioral right it's not a test that lets us know yes the person is positive for it they've got it no the person doesn't have it because they're negative what it is is behaviors and when you have a behavioral disease it's really easy to start to blame the person who's doing the behaviors and to start to Think about it differently from other chronic diseases that have more numbers and, and tests associated with them. Next slide. So I want to get into these comparisons between addiction and other chronic diseases. And so now I'll do one with diabetes. When somebody gets diagnosed with diabetes, I think all of us probably know that life is going to be different. The person with diabetes is going to have to learn how to eat differently. They're going to have to change probably the calories that they're eating, probably reduce the carbohydrates, probably learn about exercise in ways that they've never learned before because you got to exercise to keep your blood sugars normal. You may have to lose some weight. So changing your diet, changing your exercise and losing weight, like there's a big three major lifestyle changes that you have to do that are behaviors that you have to do to get this disease under control. The goal is blood sugars under control and then preventing complications. And even when you're doing the behaviors that you need to, it still may be that your blood sugars are out of control and it's not your fault. It's the disease getting to a point where it may need intervention with medicine and certain medicines you can take by mouth, like metformin, like, um, like glucotrol and, and the Actos. I mean, there's a million of them. You could take it by mouth and it may be doing okay, but then your blood sugar is still going up. What are you going to do? Well, now you're going to have to do something more intense, and that may be insulin shots, or that may be other types of injectable medications. So diabetes has therapy that is partly the responsibility of the person with diabetes to change their behaviors, and partly a collaboration with a medical provider who is prescribing medications and looking to see how we need to intensify that medical treatment to help that person get their chronic disease in control. Diabetes, just like addiction, doesn't have a cure. Even when somebody has normal numbers, they still have the disease of diabetes. It is just in remission. It is not active. It is not causing long-term complications. And so we're looking at that same type of model for how we talk about people with addictions and what their treatment looks like. So next slide. When we start to talk about people who have substance use disorders, I really want to focus on opiate use disorder today and the three FDA approved medications that we have for it methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. And I want to focus on those three because that's where most of the questions come in. And that's where I think we have room to learn and to collaborate differently than how we have in the past. I think medicines, like people who are not medical people have been involved in doing care of addictions for a long time, much longer than medicine has come into the, the fray. And we know that based on the blue book. <laughs> we know that based on what 12 step fellowship has taught us. We know that based on therapeutic communities and the rise of a sobriety and abstinence based movement that started in AA and has grown out of that into other fellowships of mutual support, such as SMART, such as Dharma Recovery, such as all the places where peers come together to provide one another support. Having medical people involved in the disease of addiction is a relatively new thing and something that I really think we have to do a better job of communicating and collaborating what we bring to the table. Because people who have been doing peer recovery for so long sometimes don't have a clear understanding of what we have to add, what we have to offer. And so I want to make sure that you have a clear understanding of that after this time with we have together. Certainly, we know that addiction has periods of time when it is in remission under control. Somebody could say that they are sober. They could say that they're in recovery. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> I like to use words that mirror other chronic diseases that are very serious that have early death associated them without treatment. And so you'll see me use language that is similar to cancer language. Why? Because people take me seriously when I talk about cancer language, when I'm talking about my patients with addiction. So I will often say that the person is having a recurrence of their disease. There has been a return to use. I don't like the word relapse. It's very judgy. 
I like words that are a little more medical, a little more professional, a little more similar to other serious chronic diseases that people respect. I will also say that a person who is in long term recovery or is in remission of their substance use disorder or who has achieved sobriety with use of medication. People can identify their recovery as they want it. And so I try to mirror the language that my patient has chosen to describe their recovery and then put additional descriptors on it so that other people who don't know what we're talking about can be brought into the fold. Perfect example of this. Somebody says, I'm sober. A lot of people mean in their head, whatever I'm doing is working for me. Now they may still be smoking marijuana and somebody else may say sober. You're using, you're using pot. You're not sober. Well, no, I've chosen to use the word sober to describe me in my stage of recovery. Another person may say I'm in recovery and then another one of their peers finds out they're on methadone. They're like, you're not in recovery. No one can be in recovery if they're on methadone. What is that telling us? So that would be very similar to saying, hey, you just had a heart attack. You're taking aspirin, try to prevent another heart attack. That's ridiculous. Why would you do that? Why would you stay on a medicine that's going to prevent another heart attack? When we talk about people who are choosing to be on methadone and saying that their recovery isn't real. Pardon me. What we're doing is really stigmatizing the choices that they've made to keep themselves alive. And I want to help us understand why that isn't helpful and how we can use different language to incorporate everyone's choices around their recovery. And I apologize for my cold um, and I will try to keep the coughing under control. Next uh, slide, please. That's why I have this big glass of water. So I mentioned aspirin because that is one of those drugs that a lot of people already know about. When you take aspirin after you've had a stroke or heart attack, Many people know it's supposed to prevent you from having another stroke or another heart attack or actually death. So when we go into the second column here, the second row, aspirin after a prior heart attack, MI or CVA stroke, in order to prevent another heart attack, you got to treat nine, uh, 77 people. So NNT is number needed to treat. So the number of people who need to be taking an aspirin every day not to have another heart attack, 77. Number of people who already had a stroke, now take aspirin every day to prevent another stroke. In order to prevent one stroke, you got to have 200 people taking an aspirin every day. In order to prevent death from a heart attack or stroke for people who've already had one, you got to have 333 people take an aspirin every single day before you prevent one person from dying. And we recommend this for everybody. These numbers are good. They're really good. But look at buprenorphine. This is the generic name for Suboxone. In order to keep somebody in treatment for one year, you only have to treat two people to reduce the risk of that third person <laughs> getting out of treatment and re having a recurrence of their disease. In order to prevent people from dying from opioid use disorder in the first year of treatment, you only need to treat five people, five with buprenorphine, five, not 77, not 200, not 333, five. That's profound. That means that this medicine is so powerful in reducing the risk of death. And many of these people would die from overdose, reducing the risk of overdose deaths. This medicine, if more people were on it, and if we had less stigma and more access, could really start to solve the opioid overdose crisis in ways that we have not been able to solve yet. So think about that. These numbers are profound. Next slide. For some of you who are my age, or <laughs> slightly older, slightly younger, <clears throat> pardon me, you may have seen this and know the, um, <laughs> I'm, I probably cough when I do it, but you know the nasty mean voice where it says, this is your brain on drugs, any questions? Like, no, it's not. We know much better now. This has nothing to do with your brain on drugs. Your brain doesn't become mush. It doesn't become a fried egg when you use drugs. Next slide. What we know about brains on drugs is that dopamine changes are really important in leading to and sustaining addiction. And next slide, we really need to understand what happens in that inner part of the brain where the pleasure reward pathway is to understand the behaviors associated with addiction and what we see in our clients and our patients. So I wanna give you a small brain science lecture now that I hope is really useful and also really 
um, accessible. So this picture of the brain that you're looking at now is as if we're sliced our brain midway like this from the side and you're looking at it that way. So the inner part of my brain that's sort of like right in there in the middle part is the oldest part of our brains from an evolutionary perspective. And the way that we evolved was to stay alive and our brains got in that area a little surge of dopamine, a chemical that teaches us to do a thing again. So when we eat dopamine, it's like, oh, eating, that's smart, that's good, that'll keep us alive, let's do that again. When we have sex, mm, dopamine, that feels good, that's appropriate, let's do that again. And from an evolutionary perspective, it's because the idea is that you are going to continue the survival of the species, right? These natural rewards cause these little surges of dopamine that teach us to do things to keep alive. They also help keep us away from things that would harm us, like that whole flight or fight response when you are threatened. In order to prevent death, where there's the, the saber-toothed tiger, the woolly mammoth coming at you, you are going to, in that part of your brain, recognize severe issue of threatening my life, I need to get out of here and do something to stay alive. So this part of your brain keeps you alive. Really critical, really old from an evolutionary perspective, very important. Next slide. When you have addiction, that part of your brain gets hijacked, sabotaged by the drugs. Because when the drugs go in, they don't just do a little spike of dopamine, they do huge spikes of dopamine. And if you think a little spike of dopamine told you that it's okay to eat dinner or eat lunch or eat a snack, Think of what an enormous spike of dopamine does. Not only do you have to go back and do that again, but you have to keep going back over and over because your brain quickly learns that that's the only thing that feels good. That's the only thing that feels okay, that is going to make us feel normal, good, keep us alive. Eventually, it quickly evolves into a situation where your brain gets taken over and the normal natural rewards that you're used to don't cause anything like a, a response that you need to do that thing because all you're looking for is the feeling that you got from the drug. And having cravings or having withdrawal starts to get you into a fight or flight type feeling where you need the drug to avoid the withdrawal. And if you don't get it now, you've got to do something to get it. Your brain has been completely rewired by these changes in the core, in the chemicals, certainly around dopamine, but other chemicals as well. So getting the drug, recovering from its use, using it, dealing with the effects, all that becomes a full-time job because that's what your brain has now learned to do. Losing control and ongoing use despite harm as we looked at before, are features of the disease. Pardon me. So, as you can see in this little PET scan slide here, there are brain changes that happen related to dopamine and other chemicals quickly after drug use. And those changes in some people, and you can go to the next slide, don't ever go back to a totally normal place. They will reset in a better place where healing can occur, but we don't know enough about the genetic components combined with the lived experience of people who use drugs and develop substance use disorders about what actually happens in the brain and what can go back to a more normal place or more neurotypical place compared to what damage is there that really can't be fixed. And how do you then live with the consequences of that long term? So this slide is pretty famous. So if you haven't already seen it, I'm really glad I'm in, it, giving it to you as an option because it's something you should understand about, and, and it's a cartoon, this isn't real, but it's the concept of what are the levels of dopamine that we're talking about. So if normal dopamine that sort of keeps you upright and keeps you doing a presentation like this, say it's 100, or maybe for me, it's like a 110, I don't know. So if I'm at that sort of baseline and I have a nice meal, 150. If I had a positive, pleasurable sexual experience, 200. But now look what happens when we get into drugs. Cocaine, 350. Prescription opiates, oxycontin, oxycodone, 500. 
heroin, 900. Fentanyl, probably between the heroin and methamphetamine with methamphetamine, 1300. So we're not even talking about anything remotely that is what your brain could do naturally. We're talking about really high levels of dopamine that totally wash out what was natural and normal and creates this new environment where that level of dopamine is required to feel okay, not just to get a high, because the high part goes away quickly, as we know with tolerance, where as you continue to use, you need to use more to get the same effect. And then you need to use more frequently to get the same effect to avoid the withdrawal. So tolerance develops very fast. It, this cycle, once you try to break it, where somebody decides, I can't do this anymore, I have to stop. It's not like over time, it just slowly goes back down to normal and now you're back at 100 and you feel fine. The process involves almost like a ripping of the dopamine out of your brain. And a person's experience of that isn't like just going back to zero or 100. It's almost like going back to negative numbers where they're so sick and so depressed and feeling so bad that it's hard to even function. So a person's experience of early recovery is Sometimes people will talk about opioid use disorder and the withdrawal from opiates as being like the flu, like a flu like illness. There's no patient I have ever served who talks about it like the flu. It is a thousand times worse than anything that a non experienced user has ever done. And many people who have gone through that don't ever want to go through it again. Next slide. Really important to think about <clears throat> when you have a person who is struggling with addiction, and I have that part of their brain, their reptilian brain that we just talked about, that pleasure center that's been hijacked. The other part of the brain we need to know about is this cortex, the, the neocortex, and particularly this front part, the prefrontal cortex. We talk about the inner part of the brain that's really impacted by addiction and by dopamine, but the frontal cortex is the part of our brain that's the thinking part. And that part is the part that should be in communication with our brain's drives and should say, hey, I know that you're being driven to go use cocaine, but that's not a safe choice. Let's not do cocaine and let's instead do something different that's safer, more appropriate, and will give us a feeling of that we're looking for of that boost of energy or that, that change but isn't going to cause so much harm. The problem is when people are active in their addiction, their prefrontal cortex is sort of offline. It's like you have the spinning wheel and it's still spinning and you can't get it to load. It's not acting in a way to communicate with that inner part of the brain. And so you don't get feedback around judgment. That being said, I like to think of the traditional pain scale as actually a brain scale when we're looking at our patients and their behaviors. If somebody is really doing things that don't make sense, that harm them, that harm their, their likelihood of being able to progress in society like they want. For example, if you're a PO and you have a patient you're monitoring and they start doing things to completely screw up all of the good work they've done, something's going on. Their disease is active. This part of the brain has turned off and the inner part of the brain is firing loud. They're like an eight, nine or a 10, right? They're in the part of the brain that addiction is really active. Their symptoms are severe and we can't rationalize with somebody who's there. We need to de-escalate that person to get them back into a more calm space before we can have intellectual conversations. If I want to talk to somebody in an intellectual way, I've got to have them be able to access this part of their brain which means that their behaviors are not so escalated. A one, two, three, four, maybe. I can have a conversation intellectually, a lot of details, a lot of planning with somebody who's not that escalated. But when they get into that six, seven, eight, nine, no more planning. So I think it's important to kind of gauge in your head when you're interacting with somebody, where are they? If their disease is talking, we're not gonna have a rational discussion. We're going to have to get to very basic safety. Yes, no, this, that, not a lot of high level intellectual stuff. If somebody is in a better place, they're not as escalated, they can hear you, 
You can have feedback. You can disagree. And it's collegial and calm. Fabulous. Now we can talk about plans. We can talk about a layout of what things are going to look like over time. But really think about that. Because when you're trying to do high level planning with somebody who's in their disease, it's not going to work. Next slide. So, where does MAT fit into this? Many of you have probably heard MAT <clears throat> before medication assisted treatment. We don't say that anymore um, because when somebody's on medicine for diabetes, we don't say it's diabetes assisted treatment. When somebody's taking an aspirin to save their life, prevent another heart attack, we don't say it's heart attack assisted treatment. We just say it's treatment. So, this is medication for addiction treatment, MAT, medication for addiction treatment. Why does it matter? Number one, the most effective treatment for opioid use disorder is medications. So the three FDA approved medicines, people who stay on these medicines longer end up having better outcomes. Better outcomes are everything from fewer episodes of incarceration, less HIV, less hepatitis C, less death, less overdose. The longer you're on treatment, the less likely you are to die. Next, improving people's quality of life. And this gets measured in relation to job, relationships, parenting, and again, incarceration. And then addition, adding MAT to somebody's core group, and, or not group, core um, decisions around their recovery is something that will augment the likelihood that they stay in treatment and reduce their use compared to doing no treatment with medicines at all or doing detox only or doing a short-term residential. <laughs> Pardon me. When I say short-term residential, that can mean anything up to two years because, the again, the longer you're engaged in care, the better you do. As soon as you stop treatment with MAT, that's when the benefits of it wear off and extinguish, and then you get additional risks almost back to where they were before you started. Next slide. So, when we talked about opiate withdrawal, I started to say that it is pretty classic. People hate it. It feels horrible. It's not like the flu. It is much worse than that. Many people have been in settings where they've been scored on a cow's score, this clinical opiate withdrawal score. Next slide. And there are all kinds of things that happen. Clearly, people choose medicines to avoid withdrawal. And this slide is one of Dr. Kehoe's slides where she had uh, interviews with patients who described what their, their experiences were. And I love this. There's no consequence worse than being dope sick. <clears throat> More than once, I've read this phrase describing opioid withdrawal. This patient will experience flu-like symptoms. That must be the most inaccurate statement in medicine. There is no flu that feels like being trapped in a burning room with no way to get out. The flu doesn't leave you with psychic death. It's the most brutal experience I've survived. I have post-traumatic stress disorder from withdrawing, not using. Many people are interested in medicines to prevent withdrawal, and that's a great start. Next slide. However, detox is actually quite dangerous and not effective. This slide shows that when you compare, and this Keiko article is really quite famous as well, when you compare people who have done detox only compared to those who have chosen to be on either methadone or buprenorphine, you have a death rate that goes from zero to those people who have chosen to be on buprenorphine out for one year to 20% of those who did not choose to be on maintenance therapy. These numbers, if we were talking about cancer, we'd have no, no further discussion, right? Because somebody comes to you and gets diagnosed with cancer and you have two choices of treatment. One is 20% of you are gonna die. The other is 0% of you are gonna die. Which treatment would you like, right? We don't talk to our patients with opioid use disorder like this, but we should. Next slide. The other thing that I want you to know is that medications for addiction treatment aren't just to relieve withdrawal. They block the use and experience of other opioids, reduce cravings, and they do start to change some of those things that have gone awry during use in the brain chemistry. Next slide. So it reduces some of the abnormalities that have happened with the dopamine. And then I've said multiple times, it's very clear that people who choose to be on either methadone or buprenorphine reduce their risk of death from overdose, 
or other drug related causes. So really, really important to understand that choosing methadone or being uh, on buprenorphine, those two medicines are the ones that can reduce your risk of death. Next slide. So I wanna just spend a couple minutes giving context for Massachusetts. We had almost 2,400 people die in the Commonwealth in 2022. And the communities of our sisters, brothers, neighbors who were hit the hardest are people who are black. So black men, highest hit, increased numbers. In, in fact, increased death rate by 42% from 2021 to 2022. For black women, increased breath, death rate as well. Unbelievable numbers here, completely unacceptable. Why do I point out this ethnic racial divide? Because again, for those of us who have power and privilege, it is incumbent upon us to have these conversations because if you're serving people who are in the most marginalized groups where they're marginalized by their race, they're marginalized by the disease of addiction, and they're marginalized by the treatments that are offered, we've got to open that up and make sure that people know that we believe that they're suffering and that they deserve treatment and that we are going to help facilitate them getting that treatment so that they don't die. Next slide. We have the power to do that. Those of us who have the, the privilege and the voice and the platform. So fentanyl still leads. Most people are going to die from an overdose that involves fentanyl. Many people are also going to die from polysubstance fentanyl in addition to benzodiazepines, in addition to cocaine, in addition to methamphetamine. Cocaine is number two on this list here. And we know for sure that the supply of cocaine and methamphetamine that's coming through New England right now has higher potency than it has in the past, but it's also much more likely to be contaminated with fentanyl. So people who are not choosing to use opioids have no opioid tolerance because their drug choice is stimulants can die from stimulant use that is contaminated with opiates. Next slide. So this gets into medicines a little bit more. So let's spend some time on these three medicines. Methadone, highly regulated. You can only get it in OTP, which is opioid treatment program. We use that as shorthand for methadone clinic, right? Very structured, very effective, reduces overdose deaths. Buprenorphine. I only put one little picture here, Suboxone. It comes in all sorts of different forms now. We've got the Sublocade, the Brixati, we've got once a week injections, once a month injections. We've got the Probufine that hardly anyone uses. It's the little um, uh, rods that we put in your arm. It lasts for six months. We've got the pills. We've got the, um, the films, all kinds of different choices. Less structured and much more available now that they loosen the regulation so that you don't need to have that special X number to prescribe it. Any person who prescribes medicines can prescribe it now, which is awesome. It also is very effective, reduces overdose deaths. Vivitrol is something that I think a lot of people outside of the medical community feel really good about. It is available all over the place. It's less structured, less stigmatized, and it's not an opiate. It's an opiate blocker, so it doesn't come up on talk screens. It's completely safe for people in safety-sensitive work environments, and the problem with it is it's not as effective and it doesn't reduce the risk of overdose death. Next slide. So when we get into more specifics, I wanna make sure you understand how these drugs work. That little receptor there that has the, the withdrawal pain um, uh, uh, electricity coming out of it is like the opiate receptor in the brain. And that opioid molecule is like fentanyl, methadone, uh, oxycodone, any opioid, so fentanyl is an opioid and methadone is an opioid, and they fit perfectly into that receptor. So when they fit perfectly, they fully excite the receptor. It lights up and does its thing. It releases all the chemicals it's going to release, and you get the euphoria, the high, the pain relief, the withdrawal relief. It does it all. The more you give, the more effect you get. When you use something like buprenorphine, it fits into the receptor, but it's not a perfect fit. See, it's like those little tiny um, uh, yellow crystals there. They fit in the receptor and they will stimulate the receptor to do something and the receptor will, will fire and it will produce some relief of withdrawal, produce some pain relief, 
for somebody who has no tolerance at all, it'll, it'll get you high, but it is not something that as you give more, you get more effect. The effect sort of wears off because it's got a ceiling to it. And then another slide that I don't have here, but we can go to the next slide. If you just put like a piece of paper over that receptor, there's your naltrexone. It's blocking the receptor. So it's an opiate blocker. This is just a graph that shows some of that what I was talking about. The more methadone you get, the more effect you get. The more buprenorphine you get, eventually you just are peeing out buprenorphine. There's no additional effect after a certain time because of how it's a partial agonist. And then naltrexone, doesn't matter how much you give, you're never gonna affect the receptor because it's blocking. Next slide. <laughs> Methadone quick facts. What do you need to know? Major changes in how we do take homes since the pandemic and major dose shifts. So people who are on methadone, it used to be that we'd tell people around 80 milligrams, you'll probably feel comfortable. Now, probably closer to 100, 120, 130 milligrams is more of a stable dose uh, in the fentanyl era. There are a ton of drug interactions with methadone and so much stigma because of the clinic being the only place you can get it. Main side effects, constipation, sweating, sedation if you're on too much or if it's interacting with other drugs or other medical conditions that you have, and then lower testosterone. So those are actually true. It does not affect your teeth. It does not affect your bones. It's safe in pregnancy and safe in breastfeeding. It is really, really stigmatizing though, and very hard to manage for a lot of people. When you go to an opiate treatment program to get methadone, you're surrounded by a lot of people in different stages of recovery, many of whom may not be the most supportive initially until you find your people. And so a lot of people are afraid of methadone because of how you have to get it. Next slide. Buprenorphine is something that people are less afraid of. It's a partial agonist, as we talked about, so a little bit safer from an overdose perspective. Causes constipation and sedation, just like any opiate, because it is an opiate, um, and a little bit more headache associated with it. If you take it too soon after you've used, it can cause precipitated withdrawal, which is the biggest problem for people because they don't want to get sick. Remember, withdrawal at any point is horrible. Precipitated withdrawal is when you take the buprenorphine and there's still an opiate sitting there like fentanyl, the buprenorphine will kick the fentanyl off, sit itself down, and then make you wicked sick. So if you get that precipitated withdrawal, it comes on so fast, so furious. It's like you're high one minute and then you are sick as a dog the next minute. No one likes that. No one wants it. And as soon as it's happened once, people do anything to avoid it again. So for some people who have had precipitated withdrawal because they've tried Suboxone on the street or they got it in a detox and they didn't wait long enough or they just had a bad experience, they may be already on the no Suboxone ever train. And that's hard. I think we need to give people the opportunity to love Suboxone again and talk them through how we could get them started on it in a way that won't make them sick. It is very safe for pregnancy, very safe for breastfeeding, and the doses are variable. Most people will probably be on a dose between 16 and 24 milligrams a day. Um, average is around 16-ish, um, but again, in the fentanyl era, we're finding that doses need to be higher to manage people's withdrawal and cravings. Next slide. So I saved naltrexone for last because it's one that is, like I said, it's an opiate blocker and is very um, friendly for people who are having drug testing done for people who are in safety sensitive jobs, for people who also have alcohol use disorder, because it can treat both. So it's got an FDA label for both of those things. It reduces craving and it's not an opiate. So it doesn't have a physical dependence. Like once you're on it, if you decide to stop it, you just stop it. You don't have to like taper off it like you do with methadone or suboxone. So it's not great in breastfeeding, not great in pregnancy, but it's okay for both. Um, and it can be done in office, so less stigma. The biggest challenge with this, though, is that although the world loves it, it's so much less stigmatized than the other medicines, it really isn't as effective. It really doesn't have the opioid overdose protection, the risk of death protection that methadone and bup have. And our patients should be counseled full up about everything that goes on with these medicines, the benefits, the risks, and how it's gonna fit into their life. But it's really important not to hide that fact here. 
main side effect with this, a little bit of nausea. Uh, some people get a little depressed. It's pretty rare. And then you can have liver issues, but you can have liver issues with bup 2 a little more likely with naltrexone, a little less likely with methadone. Most people who have severe liver issues can take any of these medicines. Although I will say if it's really severe, like somebody who's on a transplant list, then they probably won't be on naltrexone. They probably have to be on bup or methadone. Next slide. So stigma. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> stigma is really one of the reasons why patients with opioid use disorder tend to have trouble accessing care. And a lot of it's our language. This research uh, recovery Institute has done studies where they've looked at talking to people about someone who's a substance abuser versus person who has a substance use disorder. And predictably people feel more warmly toward the person who has a substance use disorder rather than the person who's a substance abuser, even though we're talking about the same exact person. Words matter. Next slide. So I would like you to challenge yourself to think about the words that you're currently using in communication with your colleagues, with your family, and with the people who you're serving, your clients, your um, <coughs> patients, the person served. Substance use disorders or diseases. When somebody's using, it means the disease is active and they need more treatment, not less. A tox screen is not clean or dirty. A person is not clean or dirty. A person is sober. A person is in recovery. A person is experiencing a return to use. A person has had a recurrence of their use. Using words that are more professional, less judgmental, can really make a difference, can allow somebody to feel safe communicating about what their needs are. So please think about this. Somebody is suffering, may need more medicine. Somebody appears sedated. I'm worried about them. We need to get an additional assessment. So thinking about ways that we can use language to engage people and bring them forward rather than pushing them away and hiding them in the shadows where they've been marginalized to this point. Next slide. So harm reduction, here's another conversation we have to have. Nobody gets their knickers in a twist when we talk about putting on sunscreen to go outside. Now you may not like it, um, but you understand that it reduces the harm of the rays from the sun and you can reduce your risk of skin cancer. Same thing with seatbelts. We know if you're in a car accident with seatbelt on, you're likely to do better than without. One thing that's not on here, helmet. You ride a bike, you need to put on a helmet. So these things don't like make us get all bleh. Next slide. But when we talk about harm reduction in the context of patients with opioid use disorder, and we're really talking about helping people to use drugs safely, that feels weird. And it feels weird because we don't consider it to be the same type of harm reduction as non-drug use related harm reduction. So think about this, if you have a stigma around harm reduction, to connect with the ways in which it may be useful for you, your patients, your community. We know that people who achieve a degree of sobriety and recovery may have instances where they have returned to use, that's part of the disease. When they return to use, I wanna make sure that they don't die. So they have an opportunity to come back and participate in society. I also don't want them to get HIV, hepatitis C, spread it to family, children, others. We also know that these methods to reduce harm are really very cheap <laughs> and very accessible. And it helps build trust. It helps build an opportunity for someone to talk about the behaviors rather than hiding them and risking overdose and dying. Next slide. So all sorts of ways that we can help people reduce harm. I want to point out to Narcan and never use alone. And these are two that uh, you'll get the slide deck. And so you'll have access to these. But if we all are carrying Narcan with us everywhere, and here I am even here with a dose of Narcan on me all the time. So please get comfortable carrying this with you everywhere. It is something that costs very little compared to the value of a human life. Next slide. So let's talk about cases in these last few minutes, because these are ones that I heard from our community. And I know there are things that you may struggle with. A client at your sober house was out <clears throat> and came in after curfew. And that's not allowed, right? You got to follow the rules here. But in coming after curfew, they also missed their evening suboxone dose. So the question is, they broke the rules. 
they're in after curfew, they miss the dose. Do you give them the dose or do you not give them the dose? So many people who run sober homes would say they know what the rules are. They signed up here. They don't get the dose. And I would challenge you to change your rules because this is the same as if this patient had diabetes. Because their behavior has demonstrated an inability to play within the boundaries of what has been set up as when you can be out and when you have to be back should not impact their ability to have treatment for their chronic disease, which is diabetes. So when somebody misses their dose of Suboxone because they have broken a rule, we should not punish them by withholding that dose because the medicine is not something that we use as a negotiating piece or as a punishment. It is a life-saving treatment that should be offered at the time when the patient is available. So please don't use MAT to enforce punishment. It is not punishment, it is life-saving medication. Next. Your client is frustrated because her PO told her to get on Vivitrol. And every time she tries, she goes into detox, she finishes the detox, and then she has an appointment 10 days out because they told her you can't start Vivitrol. And they're right until you've been off opiates for seven to 10 days. So we're going to make your appointment for 10 days after you leave detox. And that way you'll be fine. The problem is she can't get to that appointment because she gets withdrawal within the first three or four days and has to use. And when she uses, then she cancels the appointment because she knows she's going to have a positive tox screen and she won't be able to get on the Vivitrol. So then she gets into the cycle of using again. She's got two kids. She really wants to continue parenting them, is trying desperately to do everything the PO and DCF have asked her to do, but she's also overdosed multiple times and she doesn't want to die. What is our recommendation for her? So we should really talk to her about buprenorphine or methadone. The idea that Vivitrol is the answer may be accurate down the road, but she's demonstrated to us that she can't do it because the transition from being in detox, having the support of the medications and comfort meds, and then having no support has left her really vulnerable. She's had overdoses and she is unable to sustain 10 days of abstinence to get on this medicine. To get on methadone or to get on buprenorphine, she doesn't have to have that window. That treatment can be initiated in detox or outpatient the moment she shows up. So there's no downtime. And we know that methadone and bup are the two drugs of the three FDA approved medicines that can reduce her risk of overdose. And so she's really somebody who at this point, given this history is not appropriate for Vivitrol. She really should be on either methadone or buprenorphine and possibly methadone at this point, <clears throat> given the struggle that she's had with even the experience of completing detox and not being able to go more than a couple days without using because of the discomfort from withdrawal. And next slide. So this client is already on methadone, thank goodness, at a dose of 130 milligrams daily from the clinic. And we know that 130 is about average. Um, and so at your program, that person gets their methadone in the morning at the clinic, and then they are with you during the day, and you have to watch them take their other medicines. And those medicines include gabapentin, baclofen, and Seroquel. And so you... <laughs> look up in the book, whatever, you know, go online and see every single one of them interacts with methadone and they all say something about sedating, can lower blood pressure, can increase sedation, can cause confusion. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. I'm the one, like, I'm not a doctor. I don't know anything. I'm trying to make sure this person gets their medicines. And in doing that, my heart is telling me I could be causing this person harm because I've already looked at the side effects of these medicines and this combination doesn't look right. So this makes you nervous. You don't wanna hurt somebody. You also know that some of these medicines can have withdrawal. So it's not like you wanna hold the medicine and not give it, but you gotta do something that's right. So what do you do? I would say, number one, you gotta get your supervisor involved because you guys have gotta have communication with the outside providers who are prescribing these medicines and make sure that they all know all the medicines the patient's on. So do they know the patient's on methadone? Do they realize the current dose is 130 milligrams? 
do they know that you have actually observed the patient to be sedated around 11 o'clock in the morning? They usually get their methadone at six, they get their gabapentin at eight, they get their baclofen at nine, they get the Seroquel at night. Like, if they're really tired around 11 every day, should we be changing when we give these medicines? Should we be giving different doses? Should we space them out differently? Like, ask the questions and have that collaboration because the people prescribing don't often know what your patient looks like or what your client looks like when they're with you. But if they knew, they could help you say, oh, of course, of course, I had no idea that you were giving the gabapentin and the baclofen within an hour of one another. Oh, no, 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 those should be separated by six hours. Or that dose of Seroquel at night, that's not having any effect. He's been on that for 25 years. I think it's that new gabapentin. Let's change the time of that to help so that the patient gets the relief that they need of their neuropathy with the gabapentin and can tolerate the methadone dose that they require so that they don't have a recurrence of use. So really important, if you see something, say something. But don't just make an assumption that because all these medicines are sedating, your patient's gonna be sedated from them. You'd be amazed at what people look like when they've developed tolerance to medications. And people who have multiple chronic diseases often have really complex regimens that they need to follow to stay alive. So work with us, communicate, make sure you've got that ability to go back and forth. Next slide. And I'll end with another pitch about Narcan. So it's super important that we have the ability to reverse overdoses and that we don't make assumptions about the stability of somebody's recovery. So many people die not intending to die. Most overdoses are not intentional. It's because somebody didn't estimate their tolerance correctly, didn't know there was fentanyl, and didn't have somebody around. So if we make sure people know never to use alone and that we are always available to respond if we see somebody who's down and looks like they've experienced an overdose, that's super, super important. So I will stop there. Um, I know we are right at 2 o'clock. If there are any burning questions that have come through, I'm happy to answer them. And thank you so much for being with us. We super appreciate your um, your time and attendance and dealing with my cough here. So thank you for that. No worries. Yeah, we hope you we hope you feel better too. This has been great. <clears throat> One question that's been submitted is in regard to elderly patients. As as you know, addiction does not discriminate. So there are some you know elderly residents that have lived the life of addiction, and the majority of them have the mindset of, hey, you know, my life is at, is at the end. Why waste the last bit of time trying to change? What do you think, you know, a response to that might be? It's a great question about people who are making decisions about what they want to do regarding treatment, not treatment. Um, I think it's really important to make sure, number one, we've got somebody who is not actively very depressed and doesn't need intervention around that, because sometimes people will make decisions based on untreated mental illness that were they feeling better, they may make differently. But if you say we have somebody who is of sound mind, is not actively having challenges with mental health and has a substance use disorder, they just don't wanna change because they're comfortable, they're okay, they're at the end of their life. Then we just talk about what that means. And are you going to be able to live the life that you want for yourself based on the ongoing choices you're making? If that person doesn't mind having a conversation about harm reduction, then that would be one thing I'd say is that your ongoing drug use puts you at risk for a lot of things, including death and including complications. And let's talk about what we can do to keep you alive and safe and enjoying the experience of using drugs that you would like to continue to have at this stage of your life. I don't judge people who use drugs by any means, that is a life choice. And what I want to do is help engage them in conversations to keep them safe with making that life choice. And I think it's very reasonable to have those kinds of conversations with people as long as you're not, as long as you don't forget about the parts of it that may be a cry for help. Someone may be talking to you that way, not because they actually want you to sign off on their drug use. They may be saying like, hey, I'm trying to say something that shocks you. I'm trying to get attention. I'm trying to get help. And so just be aware of the underlying message there too. That would be my thought. Great. So another question is, you know, um, methadone obviously controls the craving, but when it comes to the concept of the recovery treatment timeline and things like tapering, you know, are, are we saying that people should never stop 
taking methadone? Is treatment for life at this point? Why do we tell them typically that treatment is for a year? They're going to be continuing to use methadone. Yeah, so um, we really shouldn't be telling people treatments for a year. <laughs> we really should be talking to people about treatment, meeting them where they are. So one of the tenets of addiction treatment is to meet people where they are. And for many people coming in the door, they already have in their mind what they have learned from their life experience and what their family, friends, and, and others have told them. And it may be that they have in their mind that I'm going to be on this medicine for a year and then I'm going to stop. Or I'm going to be on for six months, then I'm going to stop. And I can meet somebody there. That's fine. As part of the conversation, however, I do think it's important for people to know what the data is. And our current data shows that the medicine works while you're on it. And then when you come off it, you no longer have the benefit of that. Meaning that you increase back to the risks of overdose, death, HIV, hepatitis C, incarceration. And that's really serious. For many people, they're willing to take the risk because of the stigma associated with the medicine. When, if we flip it and we say, we're going to talk to somebody about high blood pressure, there are tons of different medicines involved and options. If you have side effects on one, we've got 10 other classes with this disease. We've got 3 darn medicines. That's it. So, if you don't like 1 of them, you've only got 2 other choices and. In terms of the choices of medicines that can save your life and prevent overdose, it's 2. So if you eliminate 1 as a choice, you're really, really limiting your options. That being said, I also don't want people to feel. Incredibly strangled and shackled by the idea of being on this stigmatized treatment for life. Hopefully, over the course of our lifetime, this will change so that we can talk about methadone or buprenorphine in the same type of way that we talk about lisinopril and metoprolol which are medicines for high blood pressure that don't have stigma. <clears throat> when you tell somebody they're going to be on a medicine forever, that's a loss, a loss of health, a loss of freedom, but it's really different taking a pill that is prescribed and you can see your doctor four times a year versus taking a medicine you need to show up at a clinic for many months um, and potentially forever once a, week, a month if you, you know get to that level of take home. So, Long story short, we really should not be limiting our conversations about treatment, but we also should not be scaring people away from long term treatment by enforcing the idea that this is for life period. It's really a negotiation um, for every person trying to meet them where they are. That's a great point um, as a follow up to that. You mentioned there are a lot of options for treatment medicine. Um, 1 uh, attendee is curious why we don't use. Probufine is a longer term option when someone is stable. So, probufine has it is just, yeah. So, probufine is the six month injection. It's just a very strange medicine to utilize and has it, because it's a little bit challenging to insert. Um, and you have to go through a, an FDA approved insertion training. It's hard to access and it's often not covered by insurers. One of the things we're moving toward is really looking at the injectable buprenorphine options and the, there are 2 main ones in the market in the United States. 1 is the sublocade variety and the other is Brixati. Brixati has weekly as well as monthly options and then sublocade has the monthly options. And I think that what will become more standard of care as more insurers are paying for these and more patients are aware of them is these injectable options so that you really are coming into a facility once a month for treatment rather than more regularly. But yeah, the probufine, it's just, it's hard to access, hard to get covered and hard to have um, inserted and then removed and reinserted. So two final things. One, sure. um, if, if folks haven't seen it, I did put a link in the chat to a zip file with the slides and a certificate of attendance for today. We really appreciate everybody coming. The last question we have here is, um, you know, we talk about progress, um, not perfection. And in your, what I really liked about your presentation is how you talked about the different elements of stigma and how should people react if someone has, you know, return to use, but then comes back for help. How, how should we treat them? That's a great question. And I think that I often try to put myself in the position of that person. Like how, how would I feel? I would feel embarrassed, ashamed, um, 
because that's what my patients tell me. They tell me when they have to see me again, it's like this horror, except that I have 100% acceptance and they've grown to have the relationship with me where it's safe to tell me stuff. But remembering that many people are coming from a place of blame and shame internally that is so horrible that the people would literally rather die than let somebody know that they have had a return to use and that they need help. So as I start to change the minds of people around me, I make it very obvious that I carry Narcan. So when I go, you know, when you're like at a restaurant with friends and you put your cell phone down on the table, I put my Narcan on top of it. And people say, what's that? I'll say Narcan. That's so great. I start to have conversations. I wear pins sometimes that say like, um, treat addiction, save lives. So people look at me and say like, what is that? Um, I teach my kids and my kids' friends that they need to find safe adults they can talk to if they have problems. So starting to just have conversations about recovery and normalizing it. When I go to a party and there are a lot of people sitting around, you know, oh, oh what do you want to drink? I'm like, do you have anything non-alcoholic? Because I know there are some of us who don't want anything to drink. So making it clear that being somebody who is openly not going to use and is safe and comfortable saying that for others who may not be, I'm that guy now. So, so I, I think living that in the world is going to make it safer um, overall if more of us can start embodying that and living it in the world. Some great examples, definitely. That's that's helpful for me. Those, I'll, I'll take those tips for sure. And I just want to thank you for your time. I'm again. I hope you feel better. Wish everybody a happy Halloween and uh, we will conclude. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much.